For reasons beyond my comprehension, 15 years ago, I decided to become a computer science teacher. This is not a story about that, but it is related. This is a story about a question one of my students asked that I didn't know the answer to, which is fatal to teachers. We like to be know-it-alls. What did this student ask me that was clearly so profound it caused me to stick it in a video? He asked me, how does a computer work? It's a fairly innocent question, really. But like most innocent questions, it's quite hard to answer. You see, we're in the middle of a revision lesson before that group's GCSE exams later in the year. One of the students stopped whatever he was doing, which he assured me was revision, looked at me, and before I could say, yes, of course, you can go to the toilet, since that's what they normally ask, he said, but how's it work? And I looked at him. He looked at me, clearly expecting some nugget of wisdom to be dispensed, and I replied with, eh, how's what work? The CPU, how's it work? We've been doing this for nearly two years and now you ask? So here's a computer. This one is actually my main machine, so I need to not take it apart too much, but we're gonna have a look inside because it's a nice little visual aid. So there's some RAM, there's a CPU, there's an SSD. Now, if you didn't know, the CPU can only execute instructions it has fetched into its registers. Registers are tiny, tiny pieces of memory directly inside the CPU's makeup. And there's a bit of a chain going on. Data lives on the SSD. To be used, it needs loading into RAM. The CPU can then fetch instructions out of RAM one at a time to execute them. It executes the instructions by copying each one into registers. I was about to launch off into a fairly well-rehearsed lecture on the fetch execute cycle, ramble on about registers, and have a bit of a waffle with some diagrams on the whiteboard. I got as far as von Neumann when he said, no, no, I get all that stuff, but how does the CPU actually work? Well, what do you mean by work? It's got machine code, right? And it's in RAM, yeah? And it gets fetched out of RAM into the CPU. How does the CPU know what to do with it? Ah, I say, finally figuring it out. That's what the decode part does. The CPU fetches an instruction, decodes it, and then it executes it. Yes, but what goes on when it's decoding? And this is where we encounter a bit of a problem. I didn't actually know. Not because all I'd learnt was the contents of the textbook that I just regurgitate back on my kids, but because we're getting into the murky bit of computing where it crosses into electrical engineering, and I'm not one of them. How do CPUs actually work? You know, the textbooks tell us a thing. It's a very simple three-stage process, but what's really going on? If you're still watching, you're doing better than my students who normally tune out after about two minutes. So it'd be great if you gave this video a like. It's quite hard rambling to a camera, and I can't judge how asleep my audience is when they're not sat in front of me giving me some grief. Now, before we look at the CPU and what's going on inside it, let's see where this all came from in the first place. Sometimes knowing a little bit of history helps put things into perspective. So way back in computer prehistory, which I mentioned in my previous video, there was a period in time where we needed to count things and keep accurate records of them, but the manual ways were getting too slow and complex. There was also a certain world event that ultimately led to the idea of a computer and programming. This all converged at one moment in the 1970s when Intel created the 4004 CPU. The 4004 had the following specs. It had a CPU clock of 750 kilohertz. Modern CPUs are measured in gigahertz. It had a 4-bit data bus. It had a 12-bit address bus. And it had 2,300 transistors inside it. That was the whole thing. A cousin to this chip was the Z80, which we'll be using as our example for the rest of this video. You see, often you need to know how the old stuff works before learning how the new things function. There's quite a lot of similarities. And where there's differences, they make more sense if you know what came before. So here's a Z80. This is the one from my RC2014, which I built a few years ago. If we look at the RC2014, it's quite nice and it's an easy way of understanding a complete computer. We have the CPU, we have the RAM, and this is the ROM. And it's all connected through this long circuit board called a backplane. It does nothing more than connect all the pins to each other. To program it, we need to write code. Now, there are better ways to do this, but let's write some code in pure binary, speaking the machine's language. 
This is actually quite funny because my students, when they start doing computing, often imagine programming or coding as they call it involves literally typing binary on their keyboards by pressing the one and zero buttons. Binary is quite hard to type though, so we represent it as hexadecimal. But let's do the thing kids imagine programming really is. You see, the computer's language, which is its instruction set, is represented by sequences of bytes, and there's a table of them. These are all the ones that the Z80 understands. You might notice the instructions are very simple. They mostly deal with loading and storing data to and from the RAM, performing very basic logical and mathematical operations, and maybe checking the status of things. That's all you get. Everything else is built from those tiny building blocks. So let's write a little Z80 assembly program to take two numbers stored in RAM, add them together, put the answer in another memory location. So here it is in assembly. Humans write code in assembly. Then a program called an assembler turns it into raw machine code the CPU understands. I'm using a site called asm80.com. And if you've not seen assembly, this is what it looks like. It's very precise, one instruction per line. Here's kind of what it means. So the first line tells the assembler where to put this code in RAM when it's run. Then we load zero into the B register. We put the first value we want into the A register, then we add A to B, then we load the value from A, which is the answer, into B to keep it safe. The second value to add is loaded into A, and then we add what was in B back into A, and then we stop. And the lines underneath are the two values. Due to the way the CPU works, a lot of things get shuffled through the A register. We'll look at that in a minute, there's a reason. Now this turns into the following set of instructions as hexadecimal. You can see them on the screen. This has been done by an assembler, a piece of software. However, you can do this by hand, by using that table that was on that web page I showed a minute ago. So this is not anything clever. This is just a straight up program that converts a bunch of text into some numbers. Now if we look at the opcodes, which are the numbers, we can see that loading some number into B is opcode 6 and then the 0, 0 after it is the value. And the LDA with some number that's a memory address is opcode 3A. The 0C00 zero zero afterwards is read as the other way around, it's 0C. Zero 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 what this represents is the memory location further down in the code that contains the value that we want to add. The add code is opcode 80, and it doesn't take any extra parameters because all it does is add B to A and puts the result back in A. We've then got opcode 47, which means load A into B. And then other opcodes we've seen before. Finally, halt will stop the CPU, and is opcode 76. So what we've done is written some code, turned it into raw machine code, but how's that help us? This is still bytes. At best, they can be bytes in RAM. And then somehow the machine just knows what they are and how to run them. Well, let's go a bit further down the rabbit hole and look at that. Let's work at how the CPU uses those bytes to do anything by actually looking inside the CPU and watching it function. This bit is pretty cool. This is a Z80 CPU. To us it's just a black plastic square thing and it's got some legs poking out of it. To a programmer, it's a complex and elaborate state machine that takes inputs, does stuff, and gives outputs in a predictable and knowable way. Again, it's just a black box that we shove things in and get things out of. To an electrical engineer, the CPU is a complex electronic circuit made from transistors, resistors and wires, miniaturized into a single tiny integrated circuit. The problem with computing compared to anything else though is that for the most part we're looking at pictures on a screen and it's always an abstraction. It would be nice if we could see inside the CPU and watch it do something. Just like how you can watch an engine and kind of figure things out about it just by seeing it with your eyes. Well thanks to modern technology, we can slice this CPU open and watch it work using something called the Visual 6502 website. They've done a Z80 version as well. Now this colourful picture on the left is the CPU die with all the circuitry coloured in. This is physically what the CPU looks like if you took a camera and could see through the plastic casing. And if you stare at this for long enough and maybe read some of the information on the inner workings of the CPU, you can figure out what bits of this are. And if we zoom in on this bit here, this is where the registers live. 
These shapes are the actual circuits that form the registers. They are real physical things. This part here is the A register, which is where all the fun happens. Now to make it a bit easier, if I turn off some of the layers, these little yellow and orange sticks are the individual bits in the register. Bit 0 is at the top, bit 7 is at the bottom. And if we run the sample code it comes with, they flash in an interesting way as the CPU does its thing. Now I do need to make it clear, the real CPU doesn't have colours and it doesn't visually flash when it's working. That's just this software letting us see what's happening to the electricity going through the chip. So let's trace this a little bit. Now this part might not be 100% accurate. I'm not an electrical engineer, but I've had a good fiddle with this. I kind of have an idea what's going on. So this bit is the data bus coming into the CPU. The actual legs of the chip connect to this. This section is the instruction register. This is where the CPU stores the current instruction being executed. This big grid thing on the left is a big bank of program logic. I have no idea how that bit works, but my general hand wavy guess is that bits in the instruction register switch on and off signal paths in this logic that connect up the lower parts of the chip, and we'll look at them next. Now the instruction register is ordered in a way that makes sense for the physical layout of the chip, not for the people staring at it 40 years later, so it doesn't go in numerical order. The bits go in a weird order. It's 0, 1, 2, then 6, 7, then 3, 4, 5. Our first instruction is opcode 06, which in binary is 00000110. And in the layout of the CPU, it will be 0, 1, 1, and then the rest will be zeros. Let's step through the chip, and the literal bits of this should change colour. And there, look, see that? That is literally the CPU storing that instruction. It has got that out of RAM and stored it within itself, and we can see it. Let's go watch some registers, they're down at the bottom. Let's watch the CPU do the amazing task of adding 1 and 2 to get the answer 3. Hope you sat down for this. There's a nice explanation over on Ken Sheriff's blog about how they're organised. This is the A register. This is the B register. Let's step through the CPU's execution and watch what happens. So here's the A register with a 1 stored in it. Here's the B register with that 1 copied into it. And now A contains 2. So the next step is to add them, which should make A contain 3. And there it is. You can literally see the CPU almost mechanically doing things. So that was kind of fun, actually. There's not many people curious enough to go poking at the inner workings of a 40-year-old CPU for fun. If you remember back to the beginning, all this was started by one of my students asking the persistent but curious question of how does the CPU actually work? Well, now I, and hopefully you, understand a bit more about what's going on. The pattern of bits that make up the instruction switch on and off parts of the CPU's control logic and also connect up the data bus to the correct areas of the CPU because it's all just transistors turning circuits on and off. The add instruction connects the data bus to the A register and the ALU, where all the maths is done, along with one of the other registers. It's in its design. That's how it's wired up inside. We can't just add random memory locations together. The main thing is this has been a really interesting project to figure out. Going into this, I had literally no idea how it worked, but a bit of research, some thinking, and a lot of clicking about in Visual 6502 to spot patterns and just watch things change colour and hope that I could spot something. Help me make sense of it. And that's one of the core set of skills I keep trying to improve and fine tune. And it's what I like to show in my videos. I like to show why things happen and understand where that idea came from. So if you've made it this far, chances are you've also found the content quite interesting. So it'd be nice if you hit the like button. It's an input into that massive black box that tells YouTube these videos are worth showing to other people. I mean, we can understand a Z80 CPU by looking at it. No one can understand what YouTube does. Even YouTube themselves don't have a clue. But keep feeding it positive data and it'll keep producing positive things. If you've watched a few of my videos now as well, you're probably safe to subscribe because this is what I do. This is me. There's no random stuff. This isn't clickbaity things. 
and it'll also hint to YouTube that these videos are interesting to other people that it's pigeonholed like you. But until next time, I'll see you later.